Okay, Cody, here you go. Thanks, Gloria. Okay, as Gloria said, I'm Cody Wilson. I'm a PhD candidate in watershed science at CSU. And this is some research that I've been doing for the past year and a half. I'm working with my advisor, Stephanie Camp, in um, CSU's Ecosystem Science and Sustainability Department, and Joe Wagenbrenner. He's a Forest Service hydrologist currently in Arcata. Really glad to have them as co authors. Um, they've been really helpful. So, has funding from the National Science Foundation and the Joint Fire Science Program. So, I'll be talking today about rainfall thresholds to produce runoff and erosion from plot to watershed scale across three recent front range fires. This is just showing you a map of all of the recent front range fires in the past couple of decades. I want to highlight here the three fires that we'll be discussing today. From north to south, we have the High Park, Bobcat, and Hayman fires. And if you'll notice, these are three of the largest front range fires within Colorado. And it's really a problem because a lot of people just east of the mountain ranges here depend on these forested watersheds for their municipal water supplies. So it's really difficult to treat post-fire runoff because there's so much sediment and ash in the water that makes it difficult for water treatment. So a lot of interest in pre-fire mitigation or post-fire mitigation to help keep these sediments in the forest. You can see just the um, schematic here of a pre-fire scenario. You have a healthy hydrologic function, so you have trees intersecting the incident rainfall. You have some surface flow potentially from bare areas that's then sent down slope and infiltrates in the litter throughout the forest. Some of that then infiltrates and returns to the stream as subsurface flow. So you can see the water in this scenario, very good for fish, very good for people. Post-fire, you lose your trees, you lose all of that interception, you lose all of that infiltration. You have these high-intensity rainstorms that exceed the infiltration capacity of the soil. So a lot of that incident rainfall turns into overland flow, infiltration excess overland flow. And you can see, along with that runoff now, we have sediment traveling to the streams as well. Not, not as good for fish, not as good for people. So our objectives for this research were to determine whether or not we could identify rainfall thresholds that would describe um, when runoff and erosion may occur. So can we predict runoff and erosion using rainfall? It's our first objective. And then comparing thresholds across time and space, and not just throughout the front range, but from small spatial scale, so plot scale, up through watershed scale sites. And also looking at how do these post-fire treatments, such as mulching, so increased surface cover treatments post-fire, how do they affect um, these thresholds? And then using these thresholds, I should probably back up just in case um, you're not familiar with the idea of thresholds. So we set a threshold. So we have all this rainfall, say from zero to 100 millimeters per hour. So between zero and 100, some of that rainfall will not cause a response and some of it will. So that break point between what doesn't cause a response and what does cause a response, that is our threshold. So we're trying to determine, okay, what is that amount of rainfall that causes a response? So what is that threshold? You know, will it change through space? Will it change through time? And then, after determining those thresholds and their interactions with space and time, we want to make a tool um, for future fire areas. Because as you saw, a lot of the front range has burned. A lot of Colorado has burned. So if a fire happens in the future, which pretty likely, <laughs> I would guess, uh, there will be a tool now that people can determine how frequently these rainfall events will occur throughout the state. So that they can be prepared. Like where should we apply treatments or where should we maybe plan some pre-fire mitigation. So study sites that we have available for this research come from many talented authors. So here we have our smallest spatial scale, so about 600 square meters, um, plot scale we're calling them. They're planar, so flat hill slopes, uh, moderately to severely burned, 
um, all with some slope to them. They're not flat level areas. Um, they're planar areas, and there are 43 of these in the Bobcat and Hayman fire, thanks to Joe Wagenbrenner and Pete Robichaud and others. And these are ephemeral sites, so when it rains is when the runoff happens. They're not constantly flowing. And here we have hill slope sites, so um, 600 square meters up to 5.2 hectares. And on average, about the size of a football field. But the only difference is these are convergent areas. So we have two slopes that meet in a central axis, and that rill, if you will, delivers the sediment and the runoff to these downslope sediment fences here. So you can see one of the sediment fences in the High Park fire collecting sediment and runoff behind this fence, and then one of them in the Hayman fire collecting um, sediment here as well. A lot larger, though, in the second instance. And we have these distributed throughout all three Front Range fires, which is really nice for some of our comparisons. And again, these sites are also ephemeral, so when it rains is when they flow. They're not constantly flowing. In contrast, we have our larger watershed scale sites, up to 150 or 1,500 hectares. And these are distributed within the High Park and Bobcat fire, thanks to Matt Coons, John Stednick, and then myself and my advisor and some others in, um, at CSU and the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Um, Sandra Ryan is one of those researchers. So you can see here these sites are constantly flowing and in contrast to the other two spatial scales, we have continuous monitoring of the stream flow. So along with all of these sites, we have concurrently located tipping bucket rain gauges that record the depth of rainfall continuously. So I've processed that rainfall data using the USDA's Rainfall Intensity Summarization Tool. It's a really great tool. It's free software available on their website. I recommend it. it is, uh, it's really nice for processing raw rainfall data, so tips per time um, into intensities, so depth per time interval, which is what we'll be looking at here. So those high intensity storms are what are related to this infiltration excess overland flow that we're concerned about post fire. So basically I've taken all of this data from all of these different spatial scales, fires, um, and um, looked at whether or not there was a runoff and erosion response. So we have not just the raw rainfall data, but we have observations of runoff and erosion as well. And I'll show you how those um, observations are collected in a moment. And then I looked at what fire, what year post-fire, um, whether or not there was treatment. And I'm only looking at mulch treatment here. While a lot of um, these sites have really inventive treatments, um, contour felling, straw wattles, aerial seeding, I'm only looking at the mulch treatments as those were the ones that immediately provided surface cover. So I've limited um, the treatment to just whether or not there was mulch applied. And then also looking at spatial scale. So how I've compared all of these variables is I've um, created sample groups or analysis groups, if you will, which are unique combinations of fire, year post-fire treatment, whether yes or no, and spatial scale. And here is just showing you um, those sample groups or analysis groups. Um, so across the lower x-axis, you have year post-fire. So we're looking at years 0 through 4. Although the Hayman fire data for plot and hill slope scale does extend out through um, post-fire year 7 and 9, um, it's standalone in that way. So we're only looking at um, year 0 through 4 because that's when we have data from all three fires. And then across the y-axis, we have spatial scale. So you can see um, small spatial scale on the bottom up through watershed scale. And then if you notice, um, hill slope scale in black here, so for years 0 through 3, we have data on hill slope for all fires. Whereas, um, particularly in year 0, we only have watershed and plot scale for the bobcat fire. So this will come into play later when we're looking at you know, comparing these variables to see what kind of effect fire or treatment has. So the threshold identification method began by compiling all of these rainfall events. So we looked at the maximum 60-minute rainfall intensity. 
so the depth of rainfall that occurred over a one hour inter interval. And we're looking at just June through September because um, we wanted to focus on convective precipitation, so those really big thunderstorms, the high intensity rainfall. We wanted to exclude any chance of snow or snow melt runoff in our analysis. And then um, I just want to show you, uh, this is the difference between ephemeral sites and perennial sites, so our plots and hill slopes versus our watersheds. So for our plots and hill slopes, a field technician had to visit the site to determine if or when runoff and erosion occurred. So if erosion or sediment was captured behind a sediment fence, we assumed that runoff occurred. So when I say runoff, I mean both runoff and erosion. So you can see here I've highlighted in the stars site visits, so potential site visits. So the field tech goes out, you know, beginning of June, and they go back, you know, middle of July. So they notice in the middle of July that there's sediment behind the fence. So I then had to look back in between those two site visits and say, okay, no sediment, and then sediment appeared. So I linked this highest rainfall event, the highest intensity rainfall event, to this sediment that they observed. Con in contrast, the watershed scale site had continuous monitoring, so the field tech would just go out and download the data, and we'd have continuous monitoring of stream flow and continuous monitoring of rainfall, so we could then say, okay, this little peak in the hydrograph happened just after this rain event, so we know this rain event caused this peak in the hydrograph. And then this second rain event oops, caused the second larger peak in the hydrograph. So we're not looking at magnitudes, of response for this. We're just looking at did a response happen and then what is the rainfall intensity that we can then associate with that response. So I did link, um, you can see in gray, these gray bars in the hydrograph, those are all rain events. So I, I kept those. I included all rain events from June through September, but those that weren't the highest intensity event for plots and hill slopes between site visits, those were marked as no flow. And the ones that were the highest intensity, you can see in blue here, those were, those were termed yes response. They had a runoff and erosion response. Is that clear to everyone? I want to make sure that, okay. I'm beating it into the ground. <laughs> I hope not. That's okay. I just want to stop here for a second, folks, and double check your questions. Since we're sharing a computer, since we had, um, okay, so I just want to let folks know since we've had to change um, computers here that we'll be answering questions at the end, but go ahead and post them if you need to under the questions. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Okay, so that is how we determine which rainfall events have flow. And then we kept all the rainfall events for every single site, along with their concurrent tipping bucket rainfall data converted to the maximum intensity over an hour. So here um, is where it gets really interesting to me. So this is uh, about the fourth attempt we've had identifying thresholds. <laughs> and we finally found it. <laughs> we found the golden method, <laughs> if you will. So um, this equation here is just looking at, okay, for all of the large N here, this is all of the rainfall events within a sample group. So a given fire, a given spatial scale, a given treatment status, and a given year post-fire. So for all of those rainfall events from June to September, how many of them correctly predicted a runoff response? So yes is the true positive, so the rainfall was above that threshold that we determined and it correctly had a response in runoff. And then the no's are it was below the threshold, it didn't have a response. So how many of these correct predictions do we have? So it's a number from zero to one and we're saying above 90, 90% is very good prediction. So we're correctly predicting 90% of the events and then, you know, below 50% poor. Sorry about the screen bumping back and forth. I'm not used to a Windows machine, so I keep accidentally bumping <laughs> the mouse pad. So basically, um, 
not to give it all away, but when we tried our first couple of methods, we were looking at um, partition analysis, and we were looking at 10% quantiles. So a lot of it's a lot of rainfall data, and very few site visits, particularly for the plot and hill slope scale. So it's very hard to determine. Okay, are these predictions good? Are they you know are they worth you know talking about now? So this method gives you the best prediction. And not to jump ahead too far, but all of our predictions are above. Um, 70 percent, and most of them are above 85 percent. A lot of them are like near one, like 96 percent accuracy. So this is the golden method for the moment. <laughs> I'm really hoping we stick with it. I, I think it's really good, and I look forward to any comments you guys have for improvement or any questions you have, because I think that could be interesting. Um, so if you think of anything better, please let me know. Okay, does anybody have any questions on this one in particular? This method? Makes sense? I also questions, Dave. Um, nobody has any on, on here. I just want to see, like, locally. Okay. Okay. So, when comparing the thresholds after we've identified them, comparing them um, by fire, year post fire, spatial scale, and treatment. So for fire, the constants that we chose um, to keep constant <laughs> were hill slopes. Since I showed you before, we have data for all three fires throughout post-fire years zero through three, and post-fire year zero um, being the year the fire occurred. So looking at post-fire year one and um, hill slopes without treatment, because even though we're limiting the treatment to mulch treatments only, the treatment could vary. So we wanted to just keep everything constant that we could and compare across fires. So looking at hill slopes only without treatment. And then year post fire, we looked at individual fires. Um, again, hill slope scale data since that was the most abundant. And then no treatments again. And then to compare spatial scales, we kept it um, by fire again. And then um, also separated them out by year post fire. So comparing plots and hill slopes um, within the bobcat fire in post fire year zero and again without treatment. And then comparing treatments. Um, Again, keeping things separated out by fire, by year post fire, and then only looking at plot and hill slope scale data because it's really difficult having studied watersheds myself um, to quantify the surface cover throughout a watershed. So at a plot and a hill slope, you can conduct um, plot like point cover counts. But at a watershed scale, it's just not that easy. So we didn't want to have to um, pull up all the ancient remote sensing and figure out a method for that as well. So we're just looking at plots and hill slopes for the treatment effect on thresholds. Are there any questions? Okay, so the tool development, so our final objective, um, the methods to develop the tool were that we compiled all of the rainfall data from 47 NOAA Atlas sites within Colorado that had 15 minute resolution data. So you can see those here on the map. Um, this is just, they're overlaid on a digital elevation model, just showing the hill shade. So you can see the fire outlines. And, um, oh, there's a question here online from Teresa. So the mulch, how it was applied. So some of it was aerially applied, and some of it was so like hydro mulch. And then there were also um, wood strands, wood chips, and straw mulch. And I'm not sure if those were applied by helicopter, probably, or by hand, because I know the plot scale. Bobcat was applied by hand. The others were applied aerially. Okay. <laughs> Crawl Chambers said Bobcat was applied by hand, and the others were applied aerially. So I know that um, the plots and the hill slopes within some of these research sites were very um, controlled. So they had control hill slopes, and they had mulched hill slopes. So they were able to really... Um, separate out <laughs> the treatment effect. In the High Park Fire, um, Sarah Schmier, when she was doing her master's with my advisor, found um, they just mulched her site. So she like accidentally had this treatment effect study, which was kind of nice for her, I think. <laughs> it really worked out. <laughs> OK, so I, I hope that answers um, your question, Teresa. And then, so getting back to this tool development. So for each of 47 NOAA Atlas sites in Colorado that had 15-minute data, so we converted that data using the rainfall intensity summarization tool from the ARS, like we did with the fire data, um, tipping bucket data, turned that into, again, 60-minute intensities, and then um, 
looked at how frequently these events of different intensity occur throughout a year um, for the year um, the years of record. So these stations, the NOAA Atlas stations, have between 25 and 35 years of data. So really long records. Um, again, just looking at the events that happened between June and June through September, and we deleted any years that didn't have four, that had 14 days or more of missing data, since that is a pretty large piece of time in a summer season. So hopefully that's not too much detail for you guys. Uh, so yeah, we fit a polynomial function, like you can see in this graph, um, from to the rainfall intensity and the frequency, so the amount of events per year. And then we were able to um, interpolate that. So we co-creaked. So people usually do spatial interpolation with just one variable. So say these no atlas stations. We tried it. There just aren't as many stations as we would have liked in the state with this high, high resolution data. So we um, overlaid that with the PRISM data um, from Oregon State University. So this is rainfall depth from June through September um, for a 30-year period. So we interpolated those concurrently. So we co-creaked those, and um, we really like the results that we see with those. And we would have used the uh, NOAA Atlas precipitation intensity um, maps, but the lowest frequency or the lowest intensity that they have was seven millimeters per hour. And we saw some of our um, some of our thresholds are lower than that. <laughs> a lot of our thresholds are lower than that. So we ended up having to uh, just start over, and um, it's been really actually interesting to see that the result. I'll show you guys, but it's surprising that their lowest intensity is seven millimeters per hour. So we're we're able to get sub annual interval storms. So they have one-year storms, 10-year storms, 100-year storms. We have sub-year, like sub-annual interval storms that are producing runoff and erosion throughout a year, multiple times. So this could be, should be useful. So then for every threshold that we identified, we went through and we plugged that into the polynomial fit for each of the 47 stations, and then co create that result with the prism rainfall depth. So from three to seven or higher um, millimeters per hour, we have these maps of rainfall frequency where you can see how frequently a certain storm event will occur throughout the state, where it will happen, and how often. So results. So again, we have our plot through watershed data. So looking at um, how many site years we have for each spatial scale, adds up to over 500 site years of data, the majority at the hill slope scale again. And then how many site events? So how many rainfall events at a site did we have? So this is over 10,000. <laughs> I was impressed. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of data. And then our first result here, um, this is the graph showing you the fire location effects on thresholds. So along the x-axis, we have fires separated out. And um, within each fire, there's a box plot for events without a response, so those no-flow rainfall events. And they're continuously going to be open circles here. And then we have our yes response rainfall events. So I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing, but some of these no-flow have concurrent observations of yes flow. So for every group of sites, for every tipping bucket, not every site would respond to every rainfall event. But our method of keeping everything consistent, we linked all of the rainfall events to a site, even if some sites had a response and some sites didn't have a response. So, but that, that's all weeded out whenever we um, look at our prediction values later on. So. Getting to that, um, these are the thresholds that we identified that maximize the prediction. So maximize the correct number of um, observations with flow above the threshold and um, maximize the correct observations of no flow and below the threshold. So this is a range, generally. Sometimes it's wider, sometimes it's narrow. It just all depends on um, 
how high we could get the prediction and what values then reflected that maximum prediction. So you can see um, for these hill slope sites without treatment, the thresholds range from six and a half to 10 millimeters per hour with um, greater than 85% accuracy if you look at individual fires. And then so I combined all of the data across all of the fires and then the accuracy is still 85% and the threshold then is 6.6 to 7.3. And you can see they, they aren't the same throughout each fire. The rainfall data isn't the same, the thresholds aren't the same. So this could be one thing to keep in mind later, like interpreting the thresholds, is that we can't control where it rains and how hard it rains. So this is kind of one just caveat that for discussion maybe later. So I looked at all of um the rainfall every year, the fire every year, and they're, they're never the same. <laughs> well, years two and three, the rainfall is similar in all the fires, but so anyway, it's just something to keep in mind. The rainfall varies a lot, so. And this is, again, um, the rainfall thresholds by year post-fire. So top, across the top, we have year post-fire. And going down, we have Bobcat. Payment and High Park fire. And then again, the no flow response and then the yes runoff and erosion were observed. And here are our thresholds. And we see what we'd hope to see in the Bobcat and High Park fires during post fire years zero through one. So the thresholds are increasing from one year to the subsequent year, but not so in the Hayman fire. And I asked my co-author, Joe Wagenbrenner, about this. And he reminded me of the paper he wrote in 2014 with Pete Rubbershoud. And um, basically, these soils in the Hayman fire, they just didn't seem to be, um, they seemed to be more erodible. And they, they also, in their paper, <laughs> didn't see a recovery in the Hayman fire either. So well, it's disturbing that Bobcat and High Park fire have this recovery. The Hayman fire doesn't appear to. And from personal observation, Joe also noted, and this will be interesting later when we look at our rainfall maps, the monsoon effect, he said, was maybe a little stronger in the Hayman fire because he has worked in Bobcat and Hayman. And he helped me in the High Park fire too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so he said the monsoon effect might be a little higher in Hayman. So, you know, these soils are just having a hard time. It's just they're eroding. Vegetation just can't get a hold. So these thresholds are just not increasing. So you would expect or you would hope, you know, pre-fire you have high thresholds because you have all this canopy and surface cover. So after a fire you have really low thresholds because you have no canopy, no surface cover. But after time you get increased surface cover and you have increased thresholds because your soils are protected. So you take more rain to cause a runoff response. Do you remember the off the top of your head the fire history of Hayman versus Bobcat and High Park areas? Whether, whether historically Hayman burned 40 years ago and High Park and Bobcat hadn't burned for 120 years? It, no, but I want to know the answer to that. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, so like how much previously had eroded? Oh, let's see if I can type in your question here. Oh. oh, yeah, okay. So, Doug wants to know <laughs> if anyone knows the fire history of these three fires. So, maybe had the Hayman fire previously burned, or, you know, same with the Bobcat or High Park, maybe 40 years, 80 years ago, if anyone knows. Okay, we'll let that sit. I'll let you know if anybody responds. I, I would like to know. Okay. So we saw no effect by fire. We saw an effect by year post fire, so a recovery effect. Now spatial scale. So along the bottom here, we have spatial scale. So P for plots, hill slopes, and then watersheds as you move to the right. And again, for every year post fire, zero through three, and then for each fire. So here are our threshold values. So what we anticipated or hypothesized was that rainfall thresholds would increase with spatial scale because it would take more um, rainfall to, or as you get 
larger spatial scales, the rainfall could infiltrate, settle out before it reaches an outlet. So it would take higher rainfall intensities to overcome that storage capacity of the landscape and produce a response. So these three sites, or these three years that I've highlighted here in the Bobcat and Hammond fires, are the only three instances where we saw an increase in thresholds with spatial scale. So we have um, up top, we have thresholds increasing from plot to hill slope and from hill slope to watershed scale in the Bobcat fire, and then from plot to hill slope scale in the Heyman fire. So this is something that interests me um, and Joe Wagenbrenner as well. These results are hot off the press, <laughs> by the way. So um, we haven't had much time to really um, think about it too hard. But you can see here the from hill slope to watershed scale in the Bobcat fire, we have this stark decrease in thresholds. And then the same from hill slope to watershed scale in the High Park fire. And this could have to do with um, time to concentration, is what Joe's thinking. So the time it takes from the runoff to get from the farthest point in the watershed to the watershed outlet that time, so that time lag maybe could contribute to this. And I'm thinking maybe it has to do with the way that we've linked the rainfall data. So with the continuous sites, we have like more certainty, like we know a rainfall event occurred and the runoff response occurred. Like we know the exact timing, but and it could just be something else entirely, like a different hydrologic pathway. So think about it, email me. <laughs> to sleep on it. I was hoping I would come up with something in my dreams last night because this is really hot off the press. So again, we see no effect by fire. We see some recovery effects. And now we see inconsistent increases in thresholds with, space, with spatial scale. And a lot of these earlier ones, you know, they're just the same is why I didn't highlight them because they're not above or below. They're just the same. Okay, and the final comparison here is the treatment effect. So again, this is, um, I'm showing you here hill slope scale data. And on the bottom, we have, again, our no flow, our yes flow for each year post fire and each fire along the secondary y axis. And then at the very bottom, we have um, yes or no what the site was treated. So on the left of each year, we have no treatment, and on the right we have with mulch. And so here we have our thresholds again, those that maximize the value. And you can see a lot of times um, these mulch sites, the highest prediction is just, you know, through the charts, like this mulch is just saying, like, you can throw any rain at us <laughs> and we'll handle it, which, I don't know, could be an effect of that, um, the golden method. <laughs> but. We'll see. So I've highlighted here for you the sites that did show a treatment effect. So basically all of the sites, um, well, besides these two, show a treatment effect. So higher rainfall was required to produce a response in runoff and erosion um, at these hill slopes. In years zero through three plus fire, which I think is great. Just, you know, good. Good for mulching. I have to tell you that I looked at for plots, the same, basically the same graph. Not as good. <laughs> I think three, only three out of the eight sample groups showed an increase with treatment in the thresholds. Whereas here, it's pretty much over, across the board. Treatment effect is obvious. OK, and here we have our rainfall threshold. Um, frequency maps. So you can see um, these dark blue colors represent greater than 10 times per year. These small events will happen, which is not too hard to believe. And again, this is just June to September. So an event with three millimeters per hour intensity. When we look at our front range fire areas, will occur um, over 10 times. As you increase in frequency, that number goes down between five to seven times per summer. A little bit higher in the Hayman area, you can see. Sorry, these maps are so small. I hope you can see them okay. Um, you get five millimeters per hour. You can see even um, 
lower frequency, but still it's happening, you know, at least a few times per year. And six and seven millimeters per hour, you know, they retreat, but they're still on pretty high frequency events. So even a seven millimeter an hour event will happen a couple times per summer. So these events, you know, they're shown to produce runoff and erosion, and they're going to happen, you know, sub one year storm intervals. So in conclusion, um, we saw that six millimeters of rain over an hour can generate runoff and erosion, and that these thresholds for rainfall um, runoff increase with time and across spatial scales um, somewhat. We need to do more research into that. And then treatments increase these thresholds as well, which is good news. Um, so for, treatments are really expensive, <laughs> but I mean, I'm sure it's cheaper than treating the water. And then these thresholds for post-fire runoff and erosion are exceeded um, multiple times throughout the course of a season. So if a fire does occur, anticipate runoff and erosion occurring, I mean, even if you have mulch treatments, runoff and erosion was still occurring. So I know this isn't a pre-fire mitigation talk, but I want to talk about that some more, <laughs> some other time. I'll take any questions you guys have. Any? It, it's, Oh, I don't know how. I think it's water. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so. It's interesting that you found some similar results to um, Sarah Schmier, sure. Schmier, that she came up with the results that indicated that any mulch post fire is going to help, no matter what it is. Yeah, as long as it doesn't blow away or run off. <laughs> yeah. So it looks like your your results substantiate what she found as well. Yeah, I mean, her that mulch well. increased the thresholds to reduce runoff and erosion. And what I'm wondering also, um, I read a little about um, mulch treatments and how they affect vegetation recovery. So I wonder if some of these results like into the future that we see, like not just the year the mulch was applied, but, you know, farther out, mm -hmm. if that could be helping the vegetation to recover. I didn't look at um, like quantitatively like how much vegetation was there for each site for each year. Just so that could be one thing like the mulch treatment even if they did blow away or run off like maybe they help vegetation become established. So like, any surface cover really is good surface cover. Except in the High Park fire we saw some pieces of otter boxes. <laughs> I don't know what was up with that. I mean it probably worked. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. This is a pot of box. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know whose idea that was. Not a lot, just a few. But probably just got thrown into the chipper. <laughs> probably. So do we have any other um, comments in chat or questions? And attendees? It doesn't look like we do. Carol. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to scroll up to it, though. Let's see. Hold on, folks. Here we are. Yeah, it's buried down in there. We have a different uh, computer here. It's just, it's really throwing it at us today. All right, we have a variety of questions. I don't think I can answer a lot of those. Um, we have a variety of questions uh, that are kind of being buried in here. Oh my gosh, do not display this question and answer. <laughs> and so we can't. Hold on, folks. Uh, mulch, how applied? Here we are. Uh, it seems like the thresholds by spatial scale would be highly influenced by soil conductivity, which may depend on soil severity. So it could also be a larger collection area resulting in a lower threshold of runoff response. Um, so we've had some interesting comments. It looks like we've had about 10 questions or more. 
Uh, and I'm thinking it's 1 o'clock and we've come to the end of our webinar. So if Cody would like to select one or two questions and answer them, or uh, we'd be glad to respond to these by email or post our, our answers in the next Southern Rockies Fire Science e-news. So I'll leave that to Cody. What would you like to do? Um, Some of these are kind of involved questions. They're just comments. Looks like that one. Just a comment. Okay. Oh, we have a oh, comment about fire, fire history. history. I think they were similar across fires. Fire had been excluded for most of the 1900s. Bill Romney et al. have a chapter on the fire history of the Hayman Fire Case Study. Uh, Rocky Mountain Research Station, General Technical Report 114. So okay. we have one of our answers there. Uh, Teresa has another question. Was the degree of slope constant in the plots? Which something I was wondering what the degree of slope, the variation in slope was. In the plot, the planar scale studies? Um, I don't remember if they listed a range for those in the studies. Um, so the one studies by Pete Robichaud and Joe Ackenbrenner. I don't know if they listed a range or if it was just like one measurement that they took. Okay. I mean, they're very small. I would guess it was just one, be like one measurement that they would take from the bottom to the top of the plot. But uh huh. And so that degree would have been, I guess. Um, what the degree? The degree of slope. Oh, I don't remember exactly the degree. Oh, okay. Maybe we, Teresa, maybe we can get back to you on that one. And the computer is <laughs> the mouse is uh, having some problems here. One would think it was either a Monday or a Friday. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Can you find it? <laughs> so I hear this. <laughs> yeah. There we so somebody so wondered how slope right there. Uh, there we go. Affected the treatments. Be interesting to pick apart the differences in mulching. In High Park. Oh, across all the and fires, then, it would be interesting. And then scroll down right there, and there's the rest of the question, I think. Compared to the other sites. Yeah, really getting like quantitative and like qualitative with the mulch treatments would be interesting. But then again, it would create more sample groups, so we ended up with 54 as it was. So if we started saying um, this site was straw mulched less than 30%, this one was wood mulch greater than 40%, like it might just complicate things to the point that we couldn't have any um, comparisons. But I do think like a study like that potentially is forthcoming if. <laughs> yeah, because we, ha we have the data, it's just we haven't analyzed it in that way yet extensively. Like we did do some multiple linear regressions for those data, but we haven't um, produced those yet because we couldn't get thresholds out of that, and that was the proposal was to determine thresholds. So that uh, would be a different paper. <laughs> and did you have any controls or comparisons with unburned sites to compare with? Because there are unburned thresholds for some sites the uh, different from post-fire erosion depending on fire severity and other pre-fire conditions. Not for this. Not for the study. Everything was moderately to severely burned, and at the larger scales, there was some low severity mixed in, but it was just all cumulative. At once it hit the watershed outlet, it was just mostly moderately to severely burned areas that were contributing. So there were some low severity areas within the watersheds, but we weren't monitoring those exclusively. Mm -hmm. So that would really be a different research question. Mm -hmm. So Frank has asked, would I strongly suggest mulching post-fire? Yes. <laughs> um, what percent slopes? 30 to 60, 60 plus? Um, I think any slope should have, any burned slope should have mulch. But I know that there are papers out there who look more. Carl, no? Not flat. Surface. There's an upper limit. An upper limit of how it will hold. 70 percent. Okay. It's just not 70. effective at keeping the mulch on the slope. And also, we have very steep slopes. You tend to end up with a high degree of rock. And if you perch the mulch above the soil surface, it, it's not effective. Okay. 
So, so there is an upper limit. There's an upper limit. Um, Carl Chambers, there's probably some papers out there specifically regarding like how mulch is best applied in different areas. I think I remember seeing some technical reports by Pete Rebuchaud, yeah. um through the Forest Service on that. I just don't remember the exact figures. So yeah, there's an upper limit for Carl Chambers and literature to that regard. So I hope you'll find that interesting for future research. And we have another question here that's similar. Mulch everything to retain moisture and add organics to moderate moderate to severe burn areas. One big fire should count for Big yeah. It's two thousand bucks an acre. So, you know, do the math. Yeah, totally. I know. I recently worked on a paper um, with Kelly Jones and others here at CSU, um, looking at comparing the costs of pre fire mitigation to the amount of sediment dredged. Like so yeah, adding mulch coverage, um, mulch treatment costs to that equation, I really think it's worth considering, like the expense before and after fire to keep the water quality high. There, there's also some information you could um, that I'm sure must have been written up uh, after the Cerro Grande fire outside of Los Alamos because um, they had straw on that entire hillside within two weeks, two or three weeks after the fire. Just it was just covered with golden straw, you know, for, for acres and acres and acres. So I don't know, you know, that was back in the nineties, so I, I think the cost would have been somewhat lower. But some of those slopes I'm sure would have been over sixty percent. So I'm I'm interested to see, you know, there might be research out of the Cerro Grande fire mulching after that. Um, Carl has a question. Tori, I had a question for you about um, the assumption that you made for your non-continuously monitored sites uh, regarding the, um, the uh, linkage of the greatest rainfall event to um, a yes answer, yes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for a sediment move. I mean, it's certainly conceivable that a sediment move in multiple instances, mm -hmm. um, you know, not only in the largest event, but also in, in uh, smaller events. Like moderate, yeah. Um, I agree. I'm trying to think about in, w in which direction did, would that, would your assumption push your threshold, sort of push it up or down? So having the false negative, or false positives, or let me think about this. So. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like undetected positives, aren't they? Yeah, so a false you've got a six followed by negative. Seven. You're assigning it to a seven. So, six yeah. Seven. Yeah. You don't know. Yeah, when we initially did this analysis, so Carl has asked uh, about how we assigned rainfall events between site visits to the maximum rainfall when, in fact, well, potentially, in fact, um, other events that were nearly as intense could have also contributed to the erosion. And then how would that affect the predictions and the thresholds? So I think that's a great question. So when we initially did this research, um, we only included for the ephemeral sites actual like site visits. And we didn't include um, the rainfall with no flow. We just only included the site visits and the highest intensity rainfall between. So we didn't include that other event that may have also contributed to the runoff event. So instead of having um, this false positive, like or false negative, really, because it would have potentially produced rainfall, but it would be marked as a no flow. So instead of having those data, we just kept only the site visit data in the maximum intensity. So by including those events, I feel like I should like have to write this down. Like I want to do like a little math to figure out how that would really affect our thresholds. But I think depending on how many of those you have, so how many sites are linked to that tipping bucket and these rainfall events, so that would, like depending on how many sites responded or didn't respond, like all of these things would come into play with increasing or decreasing the prediction or affecting um, the threshold values. So I think if you have a false negative and you're trying to optimize your prediction so you want probably to go above that value like Doug was saying like it would probably artificially inflate your thresholds because you'd want to only have um, no runoff below the value so you'd have a 
good, accurate prediction. So I think it would artificially inflate it, depending on how many other sites you had with flow. So it's just kind of complicated, like how the, like this balance occurs between sites with accurate predictions above the threshold and sites with accurate predictions below the threshold, and like how many of these rainfall events are accurately um, describing the flow. I think it gets really difficult. Like this is one of the most difficult parts for me, is linking these rainfall events that we don't know whether or not they produce the response. That ties into another question that you have about why why not factor in rain or snow events. Um, so there's this question, one more question, and uh, I'm not sure if you want to answer those separately and close the webinar or continue. Um, I need to go soon, but um, just for this one, uh, Lisa is wondering why not factor in rain on snow? Uh, because a lot of times, um, the tipping buckets we have don't record snow, <laughs> so we can only really accurately um, quantify rainfall at our sites. So we don't visit the sites in the winter because not a lot. Every spring we go out to the sites, um, at least in the High Park Fire. I personally would go out to my sites every spring, and there just wouldn't be any erosion behind the fence. So we didn't see a lot of action in the winter. We mostly saw a response and runoff and erosion after these large um, convective summer thunderstorms. And one more question oh. really quick. Um, did any of the sites have soil testing done, hydrophobic, hydrophilic um, soil conditions throughout the course of the study? Um, I don't actually remember if the Bobcat or Hayman fires did hydrophobicity testing um, or if they did that in the High Park fire. I know that soil texture was described for every fire. But I don't remember the hydrophobicity results, if there were any. There was hydrophobicity done in the Bobcat. Now, there were studies done on hydrophobicity, but how many of them overlapped with the plots that you were looking at? I yeah. Don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. So Carl was saying there were some studies of hydrophobicity, but whether or not they overlapped with the plots that we are looking at in this study, um, it's hard to say at this point. And so Doug had a question as well. So I think that um, concludes our time with uh, the webinar. I'd like to thank Cody Wilson and our uh, in-room audience, as well as all the folks who, uh, who came. And thank you again for your patience with all our technical difficulties. Hopefully that won't happen again on a Southern Rockies Fire Science Network webinar. Uh, we had some computer issues. And this webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be uploaded soon and will be posted to our YouTube channel next week. So you would go to YouTube, type in Southern Rockies Fire Science Network, and um, it should be there under webinars. Um, thank you very much for your attendance, and this concludes the webinar.